Revelation 22, let's begin reading in verse 8. And uh, we'll read down to verse 12, Revelation 22. I hope you've enjoyed the book. Amen. Um, you know, when I go through a book, I, I learn lots of things, too. Um, and God works in my heart, too. And uh, I hope that we get to the place that we see in this passage here, after all that we heard, okay? And that's kind of what the message is about tonight, and you'll see why in a few moments. But, um, you know, the Bible's true, and um, these things are going to happen. And the big question is, what are we going to do with them, you know, with what we know? Verse 8, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. We'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray tonight as I preach the message that I believe that you've led me to preach, that you'd please help me, Lord, to be clear tonight. Please use your word to stir our hearts and to challenge us that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers. And so I pray for a fresh filling of thy spirit, and again, that you'd use me to bring glory to yourself. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from our sin. And I do pray if someone's here tonight that's not saved, that tonight would be the night of salvation for them. And for the believer, Lord, that you'd challenge us again and through your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've now come to this, really, the final section of the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. I would imagine there will probably, probably be only one more message after this one. I think we're nearing 50 of them uh, through these 22 chapters. But I want you to think about where we are in this book for a moment. For the past 22 chapters, we have read all of the detailed descriptions of primarily future events. Uh, things that God has told us are going to happen. He told us about the church age in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, then in chapter 4 and 5, he, we see the picture of the rapture and we're given a vision of heaven really for the first time in Revelation, standing before the throne with all those beings, if you'll remember, all around, and the 24 elders and people falling down to worship the Lord. Then he tells John to gaze down to earth and see what's going to take place while he's in heaven, and he shows him uh, chapter after chapter what's going to take place during the seven-year tribulation period. He shows John the seven sealed judgments with the seven trumpet judgments and the seven vile judgments and all the things that take place. Do you remember all those things? I mean, the Antichrist being revealed, the catastrophes all around the earth, all of that. And then by the time we get to chapter 19, we see finally the Lord Jesus Christ returning to earth. He comes and he sets up his 1,000-year millennial reign. He binds a Satan and then we see after the 1,000-year millennium, the final rebellion of mankind, and we read of the final destruction of the heaven and the earth. And then we get this detailed description for the past two chapters, chapter 21 and 22, of this new Jerusalem. God pulls back the curtain for a moment, and he allows us to see something that we could not see otherwise to know something that we would otherwise not know as we gaze on this city that is made of pure gold, so pure it's clear as crystal. And it's lit by the light of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
He describes for us the walls of that city and the gates of that city and the angels that are by the gates and the gates that are made of pearl. He mentions the tree that is a tree of life that is in that city. We walk down in our mind's eye the street of gold. We see flowing from the throne of God the river of life, the river of water of life that leads us right to the very center of heaven, the very throne of God. Everything that God wants us to know about the future as we get to the passage I've read tonight has been said. There's no more to be said. He's told us all he wants us to know. And we have come to not only the last portion of the book of the Revelation, but the last portion of the entire Bible. This is it. These, think about it, we are reading now as we read these last few verses from verses 8 to, uh, to 21, we are now reading God's final written words to mankind. This is it. His last charge to me and to you. And after God has said everything, he wants to say about the future in these last 14 verses, He's going to give us one final call to action. The question is, will we heed? Are we going to listen? Is it going to move us? I want you to notice, if you will, verse 8 of our text, because I, as I read this verse, it kind of captured my mind. And I, John saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen. I'm going to stop right there. This morning, or this evening, I'd like to preach on the subject, when I heard and seen these things. Do you know one of the greatest dangers of the Christian life that you and I face as we are saved for some period of time, one of the greatest dangers that you and I face is this, familiarity. Familiarity. When the stories of the Bible are not heard for the first time anymore, perhaps they're heard for the hundredth time. When a message on a passage is not heard for the first time, but perhaps for the twentieth time. When the truths from God's word and the urgent calls and the pleading of preachers uh, and God's servants uh, become uh, familiar to us. They become academic to us and unmoving. Is that possible? Yes. And many times highly probable if we're not careful. So many Christians can hear sermons from God's Word and, and after a while they're just lulled to sleep. It's kind of like Paul said in 1 Corinthians ch uh, chapter 13, uh, the great charity uh, chapter, his words have become a tinkling cymbal and sounding brass. In other words, it's old hat. It just goes in one ear and out the other. And the preaching of God's Word now fails to move us like it once did. And we read the Bible every day, but it becomes mechanical. And the sound of God's voice uh, is no longer heard. That's a very dangerous place to be. Think about it. We come to service at the same time. We sit in the same seat. You do, most of you. And I know when you change. You know, it's not a bad idea maybe to change your seat once in a while. No, I really mean that. To break up the familiarity. To break it up a little bit. Thank you for moving over one. Amen. Do you feel much better now? Amen. But think about it. We sing the same songs. Uh, we, say, uh, we, we go through the same motions, the same order of services. I say the same spiel. I'd like to welcome visitors here today. Uh, all the issues come down. You can probably repeat it yourself. And what happens? We tune out. We check out, we're somewhere else, and we fall asleep. That's a dangerous place to be. 
Does it bother you when you're there? Or is it just the way it is? Several years ago, actually it was in 2009, a, a tragic story had come out in the news. It was on October 24th of 2009. There was a 15-year-old girl, and you may have heard the story, that was brutally assaulted by seven young men. The men ranged in age from 14 to over 40 years old, and she was brutally assaulted for over two hours out, right outside the homecoming dance in Richmond, California. And the police were investigating it after, and they said what was even more shocking than the attack was the fact that more than two dozen people saw it taking place and did nothing about it. They just walked on by. The investigating police officer said this, quote, the fact that no one responded, no one was moved to action was very disturbing. But what about the things of God? What about when we come in and we're dealing with the, the souls of men and the very eternal things that God has for us? Does it bother us when, when uh, the God of heaven speaks to us uh, and warns us of things to come and, and describes for us uh, that there is a real uh, a heaven and a real hell and he calls us to action and we don't respond? What else can be done? What else can be done? Let's take a moment and look at John and what happens here in these last few verses of the Bible and see God's final instructions to him as the canon of Scripture closes. Notice, first of all, number one, the reaction of John. It's interesting how he reacts. We read, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. He says, I, I saw them and I heard them. Can you imagine being John? Can you imagine being the one that God chose to pen the words of the revelation of Jesus Christ and being caught up uh, from that island of Patmos into heaven and being allowed to see the things that he saw? He says he saw these things and he heard them. And notice, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saints of this book, worship God. Notice, first of all, the worship of John. He worships. He sees something, these things, and he hears them. And notice how overwhelmed that he is. Do you remember when you were overwhelmed by the preaching of the Word of God? I remember there was a time after we got, first got saved, there was not a service that went by that I didn't either cry or have a lump in my throat for holding it back. Because I was a man and I wasn't supposed to cry. Amen. I'm just kidding. Where it felt like the preacher was uh, honing in on me. I felt like it was just me and him in the room. And I felt the finger of God point things out uh, in my life. Do you remember that? And notice he's overwhelmed. So much so that what he sees causes him to fall down on his face and he begins to worship. You know, this is supposed to be the natural response to the word of God. It's supposed to be the natural response when we hear the things of God being preached. This is not the first time that the Apostle John did this. And he responded this way in chapter 1 and verse 17. We read that as he saw Jesus Christ, he fell down on his face as a dead man. Chapter 17 and verse 6, we read that he was filled with wonder at the vision of Babylon. He was so moved by what he saw. In chapter 19 and verse 10, we read after seeing the marriage supper of the Lamb that he bows down and falls on his face. And now here again in chapter 22 and verse 8, he is absolutely swept off his feet by what he sees and what he hears. This is the way it's supposed to be. But is it? 
Let me give you a few examples. Turn with me back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. As you're probably thinking of someone uh, that did the same thing, you'll think of Isaiah. How did Isaiah the prophet respond when he was encountered with God himself? And isn't that what the hearing of the preaching of the Word of God is supposed to be? It's supposed to be a divine encounter. It's not us watching some guy up here just a, a hoot and holler and scream. It's supposed to be God using a man to speak to your heart and to my heart. And notice Isaiah chapter 6, what happens? We read in verse 1, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Do you see the Lord? What do you see when you hear preaching of God's word? Do you see God? Or do we see the back of our eyelids? Or do we see uh, something else uh, that we have to do tomorrow? He saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then, notice the word then, when he saw, just like the Apostle John, when he heard these things and saw these things, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Notice, there's another word, then, there it is again. Then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. You see, when Isaiah, like John, got a, a proper view of God uh, and this encounter with God, it caused him to see his sin as God wanted him to see it. And it caused him to have a proper view of God and a proper view of service. And he falls down and says, here am I, send me, Lord. I'll do anything you want me to do. Is that how you and I respond? God forbid we come to the altar and shed a tear. We might disrupt the formal worship service we're having. We might send the service a few minutes over the time we're supposed to end. What are we here for? We're here to do some sort of duty to punch our religious time clock, as I mentioned this morning? Or are we here to meet with God? Remember the Apostle Paul when he met the Lord on the road uh, to Damascus? Same thing happened. He fell down and uh, after he came to know the Lord as Savior, what did he say? Similar to what Isaiah said here in Isaiah chapter 6. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Perhaps that's why we're seeing less surrender than we've seen before. is because the things of God have become old hat to us. Mechanical, you know, unmoving. How do you respond? How do I respond when we hear the things of God? It ought to cause us to do more than just nod our head, uh, to give mental assent to the truths of what we hear. It should bring forth in our hearts and our lives a, a spirit of humility, a spirit of, of submission. It, it should move us to action. It should drive us uh, to our knees. It, it should cause us to fall down and worship our God and cry out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? But again, I ask, does it? Are we bothered because we're not bothered anymore? How can we hear what we hear and know what we know and not be moved to action? Something's wrong. So we see the worship of John. But we also see, notice, the warning of the angel. It's interesting what John does with this reaction. We're talking about the reaction of John. 
Notice what we read in verse 9. Then saith he to me. Again, we'll read verse 8 towards the end. I fell down to worship. Notice before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Uh, so John began with the right attitude, but he, he went on to perform the wrong action. He noticed what he does. In his zeal, what does he do? He's moved by what he sees, uh, and he wants to bow down and worship, but he sees this angel there, and so that's what he does. He bows down and he worships the angel. He made this mistake before in chapter 19 in verse 10. We read the same thing. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. Here he is doing it again. And notice what happens. The angel rebukes him. He, he, he warns him. He says, don't worship me. I'm not God. We're only to worship God. I am simply a, a fellow servant. Equal in some sense, if you will, on the same plane as a servant of God. And uh, he should be classified with the prophets. And then he commands John to worship God. You know, I think there's a truth here we need to understand that you and I need to be careful that in our zeal for God, we do not get carried away and begin to do things uh, that are displeasing to the Lord. And it can be done. Do you remember what happened in Matthew chapter 17? Let's go there as we think about the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same type of thing happened with Peter. He had in his mind kind of a right thing, if you will, to a degree, but he let it get, carry him away into doing something wrong. We read in Matthew chapter 17, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, in verse 2, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as, uh, as the light, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Well, that was real good. That was a good idea, not... He's thinking, wow, this is so wonderful. I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, look, here's the Lord Jesus, and he's being transfigured, and uh, I'm getting a glimpse of his glory. And look, it's Moses and Elijah. Uh, let's build a tabernacle for them all. Oh, oh, Peter. Verse 5, while yet he spake, he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Notice, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, notice they saw no man save Jesus only. They were corrected, correcting them. You see, John in Revelation was uh, moved by what he saw, but he was moved to do something that was displeasing to the Lord. And you and I have to remember this truth, that yes, we need to be moved by the Word of God, but not to a place where we do things that are displeasing to God. You say, what do you mean by that? Oh, there's people all over that in the name of God, they, they rap in the name of God. They get tattoos for Jesus. They skip church on Sunday but ride their motorcycles around the United States for Jesus' sake. Now, they may be zealous for God, and they may have that zeal, but they've allowed that zeal to bring them to a place of disobedience to God. We need to be careful. I think that's what the problem is with a lot of this music. Amen. Bringing in the world's music in the name of Jesus. Hold on a minute. Yes, we need to be zealous. Yes, we need to fall down on our face and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. But it needs to be what he wants us to do. Not what we want to do. 
You see, God's desire is for us, as we learn from John's reaction here, is to, yes, respond to the Word of God, but to God's work, God's way. Are we? So we see the reaction of John. But then notice we see also, number two, the responsibility of John. Now John's going to get some instruction. Notice we read back in Revelation 22 and verse 10. We read, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Mind you, we're giving, he's giving final instructions. Uh, he's seen everything he's going to see. And now he's saying to seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. What does all that mean? Why is he saying this to John? Well, I believe he's telling John of his responsibility. And the first thing I notice, he tells John of his work. What is the work that you and I are supposed to do? We hear preaching of the word from the word of God. We're moved by it. What are we to do? Notice he tells them, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That word seal has the idea of this. John, don't keep it for private use. Don't keep what I told you to yourself. Uh, don't uh, uh, stop it from being known uh, to everyone else. You see, John is being warned here uh, not to hide what God has said, not to conceal what God wants the world to know, not to keep to himself the things that God has shown him. And that's what we're commanded to do as well. You know, so often we become a, a reservoir instead of a conduit. Meaning that we, a reservoir lets things flow in, but nothing flows out. While a conduit is used for things to flow through it. And that's the way we're supposed to be with the Word of God. So often we learn things and we hear things. What do we learn them for? To repeat them to a lost and dying world. To take what you learn in Sunday school, to take what you learn from the pulpit of this church and, and go out in the world and spread it out to a lost and dying world. But so often, many of us, we seal the prophecies of this book. We keep it to ourselves. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 uh, says, Knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. The Bible is a book that is not meant to be kept secret. It's not meant for just a few elite people or certain individuals. It's not to be kept for private use. Uh, it was meant to be published to everyone. Everyone. As God's servants, you and I have been given the responsibility to do everything in our power to teach, and preach, and tell, distribute, to get the Word of God out into a lost and dying world. This is what we've been given to do. Psalm 68 and verse 11, The Lord gave the Word. Great was the company of those that publish it. You say, why do we run buses? Why do we have the institute? Why do we try to have a soul winning class on Saturday? Why this, 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 and this? We're trying to get the Word of God out. Why do we go and knock on doors? Why do we occasionally do uh, periodically uh, John Roman's distribution? Why do we plant churches uh, in, in Easton and, and in Wilmington? Why are we doing that? I'll tell you why. Because we're not supposed to seal the prophecy of this book. It's not just for us. And the greatest thing that the city of Wilmington can get is the Word of God. Yeah, that's, right. that's what they need. So John's reminded of his work. But he's reminded also of a second thing. And that is the will of man. Kind of an interesting verse, verse 11 is. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. What in the world does that mean? I think it means this. 
I believe it means uh, uh, this uh, angel, this, this person is telling uh, John, reminding John uh, that he cannot control the will of man. And that can be a frustrating thing. A very frustrating thing. You see, as you and I tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ, as we attempt to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the same thing's going to happen that happened with the Lord Jesus Christ, that happened with the Apostle Paul as he went from city to city. We read that some believed, as some did not believe, and some said, I'll hear that another time. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You see, it is not, we must be reminded here, that it is not within our ability, it is not within our capability uh, to make people believe. And it can be frustrating. It's only our responsibility to tell them. Have you noticed that no matter how much you love someone, you can't love them into heaven? No matter how many times you tell someone, you can't make them believe. No matter how fervently and how deeply you desire for someone to be saved, you and I cannot make them believe. Some people simply will not believe. And other than praying and telling them when we have the opportunity, there's nothing else we can do. Do you remember something that was said to the rich man? Turn with me to Luke chapter 16 quickly. Luke chapter 16. Do you remember what was said to the rich man who died and went to hell? Do you remember the discussion he had? Tell them to send someone to my five brethren because they're not saved. He was so burdened for them. Let's pick it up in verse 27. We read, then he said, in Luke chapter 16, and verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Notice the response. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Notice the response again. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know what he's saying here? It's something you and I need to understand. If, if, if the word of God is rejected, there is no other message that's going to work. There is no special formula somewhere that you have to add. You see, if the warnings of this book are not sufficient, there is no more that God has to say. Can you imagine God up in heaven saying this? What else can I do? I gave them a book. I sent them servants. I came to earth myself. I declared God, I rose from the dead, I healed people, I showed them that I was God. And here's this powerful book that tells them how to be saved. What else can I do? The truth is, there's nothing else. And John's being told here, don't take a responsibility on yourself. It's not yours. So we see the reaction of John. And then we're told the responsibility of John. And then lastly and finally, we're told of the reward of Christ. Look at verse 12 in Revelation chapter 22. We read, and behold, I come what? Quickly. A little bit of urgency, is there not? Uh, notice in verse 10 at the end, for the time is at hand. But notice he says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Notice, to give every man according to his work shall be. He's reminding John of something. There's a reward that lies ahead if he serves God. Now, mind you, remember when the apostle John penned these words, it was about 96 A.D., close to the close of the century. John himself was an old man, somewhere between 90 and 100 years old. He was exiled there on the island of Patmos. All of the other apostles had already died. 
And John is now being reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that he walked with on this earth, the one that he followed, the one that he served, the one that uh, called him into the ministry, the one that he was with in that upper room, uh, the one that uh, he laid on his breast, if you remember that, the one that Christ considered the beloved disciple, uh, the one that he saw crucified, the one that he saw resurrected, uh, that he watched ascend back to heaven, uh, is now speaking to him saying, hey, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And when he comes, he says, it'll be worth it all. It'll be worth it all. You know, when we were young, my parents, they didn't take a whole lot of vacations. We were four of us. And anyone that has four kids or more kids than that, you understand, you know the busyness of life and the difficulty as parents to get away. But there was one time that they had gotten away and uh, we had our, my father's mother, adopted mother, she adopted him, was living with us and they took a vacation to Acapulco, Mexico. And I don't remember how long they were there, but as a kid, of course, it seemed like a long time. My uh, grandmother, we called her Nanny, she watched us, you know. Well, when they came home, we were so excited to see them. And I remember coming, them coming home. To this day, I remember it because they bought, brought in their suitcase a whole bunch of things to give us. I can still remember the things they gave us. They gave all of us these sombreros, <laughs> you know, that had the tie here and we all put them on. You know, we're just little kids. I think I was probably about six years old, five years old or something. And we had these sombreros. All of us had it. Uh, they gave us all kinds, the little Morocco things, you know, you know. We, we, we really liked them. And uh, it was awesome. And uh, they had gone away again another time when my, my mother had gone to France. And uh, she come back, she gave us gifts. We, we liked that. Got to the point where when they went away, we were like, ooh, this is going to be nice. They're going to come home and bring us some stuff. Wonder what they have for us. You know what the Lord Jesus is saying? I'm away right now. When I come back, if you're serving me, I got some stuff for you. I got some gifts. And if you will simply respond to my word by submitting and falling on your face, don't allow your worship to get out of control and follow what I say to do, the responsibility to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. Don't take too much responsibility on yourself. Don't bear the burden of the soul because that's his job, to convict and draw people. Just get my word out. If you simply do that, I've got some rewards for you. I don't know exactly what they are. I think they're crowns. I'll tell you what, what a day that's going to be. And we will never regret serving him. But we'll never serve him unless when we see and hear these things, we respond in a way that's pleasing to him. Let me ask you something tonight. How's your heart? Has the word of God become, you know, church service become? Has the voice of Pastor Moore become like just almost lulling you to sleep? It can happen. Maybe tonight you need to come and find a place at the altar and say, Lord, help me to see through the preacher and see you. Help me to sing the songs, but not just sing them to sing them. Sing them so I see you and that they touch my heart and that I would once again be touched and moved by the things I see and hear. That's what we need today. There's too much sleeping in, the, in our churches today. We need to get back to responding to God's word the way that he wants us to respond. Amen. Let's pray.